It's too quiet in here. You know, I'm the guy when you play golf, everybody wants everybody to be quiet. I'm like, go ahead, talk. I don't give, the silence bothers me. You know, as an athlete, I've trained to block out noise and comments and everything else. That's why I could preach while the kids are here. It doesn't bother me. I'll just talk louder than them. So, uh, welcome. Just want to take a moment to welcome all family and friends that are here to take part in this incredible day. Do we have any visiting ministers with us today? Any, any other ministers come to see family? No, I'd just like to take a moment to honor them if they were here. I'm going to share a few things about baptism. And before I do, I want to I want to make a point. The Bible says this. Right now we see through a, a mirror that's foggy, a glass that's a little dirty, which we're trying to get a picture of who Christ is in truth. And the more we pray, the closer we get, the more we study. But but the Bible says when we finally leave this earth, we will see him face to face. We will know him as he is. And, and obviously he knows us, but it'll, it'll be crystal clear. So while we're here on earth, the one thing that's crystal clear to me is the importance of unity and, and understanding that strife and confusion is of the enemy. And, and God wants us to, to be able to, even if we have to, disagree and, and still find a way to keep unity. So I'm going to share our perspective based on how I read the scriptures about what baptism is and what's required. And you don't have to agree with me. You may have a different opinion, but you can still love me. And I'm not trying to knock what anybody else believes, um, but it's important that, that we find our, our answers and truth in scripture. So I just want to start out, whoop, almost put my keypad in the, in the baptism. <laughs> There's usually a platform up there. <laughs> Give me one second. I mean, first of all, what's required to be baptized? First of all, it talks about those who repent and believe. In Mark 16, 16, it says, Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who refuse to believe will be condemned. So we see that the, uh, the act of believing and making a decision for Christ is a part of why you would get baptized. That's why we do it as adults, because there's a decision you make. Baptism, you know, I was talking with my youngest daughter last night. She wanted to get baptized. And then there's, a, there's an age where you're like, do they know what they're doing? Do they not what they're, know what they're doing? And I went back and forth and we try to teach them and, and ask them. And, and I used my, my ring as an example. I said, what, what does this ring mean? And, and it means I'm married. I said, so let me ask you a question. If I take my ring off, oh my goodness. Am I still married? And the answer is yes. So this is just a symbol, yeah. This is a symbol that other people see it on my finger and say he's a married man. And unfortunately today, sometimes it doesn't stop women from, that's another story. We're living in a deprived world. But this is also a symbol of the commitment I made to my wife to have her and her alone as my wife and, and not to have any other but her till death do us part. So this is a symbol of the decision I made. So baptism is very much like a wedding ring. It's a symbol of a decision that someone had made to, to follow Christ and make him the Lord, to, to live a life, uh, to serve him and, and to trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. So baptism is a symbol of that decision. when. Let me read the scripture first in Romans 6, 4. I'll get, let them put it up. Romans 6, 4. I 
I, I caught them. They usually I have it almost before I say it. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Okay, so there's, it says that we're buried with him through baptism into death. So baptism is, is a, another symbol of, of death. It's referred to in the, the Bible as a, a watery grave. Um, so what you're saying is, I am dying to self. The sinful nature. The, the Bible talks about us having two natures. The flesh, which is evil, which always wants to go opposite of God. Doesn't want to please God, doesn't know how to please God. It says it can't please God. And then we have our spirit, which along with our theme has been made new. Before you accepted Christ, your spirit's dead. It has no opinion, it has no voice, there's no unction, there's nothing. It's lifeless. So basically, your mind comes up with an idea, or your flesh comes up with an idea, where, wherever it comes from. But without God in your life and without a renewed spirit, it's not going to be a good idea. It, it always wants more. It always wants to be addicted. It always wants to, to go the wrong way and get revenge. And the Bible talks about the works of the flesh. So without a new spirit, maybe the uh, fear of getting arrested might stop you from doing certain things. Or getting a spanking from your mommy and daddy might stop you from doing certain things. But when this new life, this newness of life comes in, something happens on the inside. And I remember when this happened to me. Because if you would have asked me if God existed, I would have said yes. But, I, but as I say, if there was a lie detector hooked up to my finger, the needle would have went to like one or two. Because you wouldn't want to say no. Who's going to say no and risk going to hell? You don't want to say that. So you say yes, because it's the right answer. But it wasn't a truthful answer. I thought I was being truthful. But for six months, I, mean, I had a, a, a tremendous experience. I was working in a church, and I saw a crucifix, and I just said, listen, they told me you're the son of God, and you died for me. I said, if you show me, if I could know this for real, so just understand that question. If you ask me at one point, is God real, I would have said yes, but here I am looking at a crucifix saying, are you real? So there was a contradiction, and I didn't even realize it. And, and you may be at that place, on one hand saying, yeah, I believe in God, but in your heart of hearts, do you really? I mean, do you really know that you know that there's a God in heaven? And most importantly, do you know that what he did on the cross for you was sufficient to wipe away all your sins? Do you really believe that, or do you just hope? Do you just hope and relying on God's goodness and graciousness that when I get there, he'll just... Well, unfortunately, that's not what the Bible says. So there I was saying, God, if you're real, show me. And then my boss pulled over that day and said, God told me to talk to you. A guy I hadn't seen in five or six years that used to tell me about Jesus who moved away, came back and said, God sent me back because you had questions. And, and that wasn't enough for me to know that there was a God. When I say no, I'm talking about I know that I know. That wasn't enough. That was enough to pique my interest. That was enough to say, oh my goodness, maybe there's a God. It was enough for me to say, oh no, if there's a God, I'm going to hell because I'm in trouble. I mean, sometimes you're, you're better off not being a good person so you know you, you're in trouble. If you think you're good and you're getting to heaven on your goodness, that's, that's going to be a sad day when you get there. So I, I used that to start searching the scriptures. The first scripture I read, if you search for me with all your heart, you shall find me. And I said, deal. I know how to do something with all my heart. It's just in my nature. If I play any sport, if I play a card game, if I play let's hit the stick with a ball I, I I'm doing it with all my heart so I know how to do something with all my heart and I did that for six months I don't think I watched TV or listened to anything on the radio I had 
testimony tapes in my car and I had my Bible and I would consume it for six months. Because if God was who they told me he was, I had to know him. If somebody loved me enough to let their child die for me, I would never find anyone that would love me more than that person. I had to know them, but if I searched and couldn't find them, then I, it would, it's just a fairy tale. It's too good to be true. So for six months I searched, and it was the night before Easter, I read 1 John 1, 9, it says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all sin and all unrighteousness, and I did it. Now you don't have to do this, but I confessed everything I ever thought I did wrong, and I kept going and going and going and going, and every time I thought I was almost done, I thought of 50 things more, and it was just, boy, if you think about every lie you told, every time you stole or cheated, and I'm not talking about, well, they don't care if I take the stuff from work. Yeah, they do. If you were the boss, you wouldn't like people taking all your pens and notebooks and just to, to stock their ca cabinets at home. If you were the boss, you wouldn't like it. I had a painting business. I wouldn't like it if the guy goes, oh, I gotta paint my room. He won't miss two gallons of paint. No, I paid for the two gallons of paint. I wouldn't like it. And just because I ordered 50 gallons doesn't mean I don't care if two are gone. So if you really look at what lying is, it's just not telling the truth. Well, it's a little white lie. No, it's a lie. So I started looking at my life going, if I put my life through that, I'm, I'm in big trouble. Well, that's kind of where God wants you to come. And, and, and I just want to add here, if you are on trial for murder, even though that's the only bad thing you might have ever done in your life, one bad thing, that the only thing you ever done wrong, you couldn't go before the judge and say, but I give to the poor, I do this, I'm a good person, I never lie. You couldn't list all of your good works to undo the bad work. You still did it. The penalty of murder is life in prison, so all your good works doesn't undo that bad work. So all of your good works don't undo your sin. And that's really the place God needs to get us to so we can say, you know what? I trust in you and you alone. I trust in the blood of Jesus as the only solution that washes away my sin. That's where we have to get to, because the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. You know, if we go to God and say, but I'm a good person, you're, you're basically saying, I, don't, I didn't need your son, why'd you send him? Imagine giving everything you had to someone and go, I, I don't need that. So, so we come to a place where we humble ourselves and realize we can't do it on our own and accept what Christ did for us. And again, it talks about being buried with him into death, and we, when he died, I died, my flesh. When he rose, that I was raised with him to newness of life, and then it says this, even so we should walk in newness of life. And we covered that in this series, that there's a new way to walk, but it's always our choice. God never makes anyone do anything. So the dif difference between the method of baptism. John 3.23 says this. First of all, the word baptize in the Greek, which is what it was written in, it can mean to sprinkle or to dip, to immerse, to put under. It can mean both. So how do we come up with the way that God would prefer us to do it? Looking at scriptures. So let's go to John 3.23. It says, John was also baptizing at Enon and Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. Well, why would you need plenty of water if you were just going to sprinkle? Okay, so we, we're, we're looking at what the scriptural precedent and, and what they did in the scripture to baptize people. So he went to where there was plenty of water because he was dipping people. Acts 8.36. Philip was on the road. 
see this newness of life is so awesome. Philip, the, the Ethiopian, was out preaching the gospel. And he saw somebody in a chariot and God basically said, get in the chariot and start telling them about me. Boy, there's some people in here that I could never do that. Well, you're missing out. If God tells you to do it, do it. There's a car at a red light. God says, get in. <laughs> get in and say, sorry, sir, God told me to do this. I mean, people are going to think you're crazy, but if you're led by the Spirit, you know what they'll say? I can't believe this. I was just praying this morning. God just, because you, you notice if you read the story, the guy was reading the scriptures. He was searching for God. So God's not going to get you to hop into somebody's car if it's really him, if they're rejecting him. He's going to send you to places where people are hungry, if you're willing. It says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave the orders to stop, stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. Again, the biblical way that they did, they went down into the water. Didn't sprinkle them, they went down into the water. Also, when Jesus ba got baptized, it says when he came up out of the water. So again, we're looking at what the Bible says, the process for baptizing. So that's why we do it the way we do. First, the decision has to be made. And then the symbol of dying with Christ in the water, going into a watery grave, dying to self, dying to the way you used to do things, dying to call the shots your own, and then making coming up out of the water and giving Jesus Christ the rightful place as Lord of your life on the throne of your heart to call the shots in your life. That's what the symbolism is. You know, there's, we're talking about this newness of life and what that means. And, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you realize how much your free will plays in how you walk this out. You know, when you, you we, we mention the phrases, you know, you never know what God will do. You know, God's in control. I'm just trusting God. And I said that those phrases have conditions attached to them. The Bible says all things are possible. Well, you're quoting half a scripture because the next part says to those who believe. You know, when you're saying you're trusting God, well, um, what gives you the right to trust him? And, and you, you wouldn't do that with salvation. Well, I'm just trusting God to save me. The Bible says it's God's will that none should perish. And if God's will was done every time because it's God's will, then everyone would be saved. And the Bible says not everyone's going to be saved. So if God doesn't exercise his sovereign right over you to force you to do something in salvation, he's not going to force it over you in any other area. Amen. So we should walk in newness of life. And for those who have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, and you're walking, the level you walk is also up to you. I thought about this. The most important thing God wanted through this whole thing was relationship. That's why he created us, to have family. So when you accept Christ as Lord, it's kind of like dating. You, you can have a girlfriend that you go out on a date once in a while and you kind of like don't want to cramp your style. You just kind of, you know, want to go out on a date when you want to go out on a date. But the rest of the week you want to play golf, do what you want to do. You don't, and and the, the kind of God that he is, if that's what you'll give him, that's what he'll take. Or you could be a serious girlfriend, and even engaged. We are spending a lot of time and you're talking about important things and, and the new life that you're going to live together. And you spend a whole lot more time together when you're engaged and you talk on the phone a lot. And then there's the next level when you're actually married. Listen, if you're married, you, you just, there's a level of relationship that you didn't have with a girlfriend. You're living together. You're in the same house. You're intimate. You talk on the phone. You talk about things all day long about where you're going. Don't forget to bring this. Don't do this. About the kid. There's that intimate, constant communication when you're married. And that's what God's looking for in us. 
So as you get baptized, you're coming out of the water. And, and it talks about walking in this newness of life. Galatians 5.16 says, Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. It, it's not a matter of saying, and, and the best way I could describe that is if that speaker represented sin, and then we have this side is God. When we get saved, and it says to walk in newness of life, we don't look at the sin in our life and make a big list of wrongs and do this and don't do that and say, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. Because the Bible says what you set your mind on is what you're going to be attracted to. So if you're constantly looking at your sin and your shortcomings and saying, I shouldn't do it, I can't do it, the fact that you're looking at it, you're going to be drawn to it. But this newness of life causes us to turn around and, and see God and say, man, I want more of Him. So you just take a step closer to Him. And as I take a step closer to Him, what did I just do to sin? I took a step away from it. So this, this living in the Spirit and out of your spirit causes you to draw to Christ. And the closer you get, the better you feel, the more joy you have, the more love you feel, the, the, the more purpose you have in life. And, and then when you get a glimpse of something in your own old life that you realize is going to draw you back this way, then you look at it and go, no way. The desire for it leaves. It's no longer saying, I can't. When you get to a place where you don't want to as opposed to saying, I can't, is when you're really free. Otherwise, you're just following a bunch of rules and it's lifeless. So when I accepted Christ, this, this newness, Sunday morning, Easter morning after repenting all night long, they were having communion and I was getting ready to go and the person I was with said, you can't go to communion because you didn't confess your sins because that's what we were taught. I said, yes, I did. I read in the Bible that if I confess my sins, he is faithful. It means he'll do it every time. I don't have to wonder. He's just. He has the right to forgive me. He paid the price for my sins, so he can forgive me. And he will, and he has cleansed me from all my sin and all of my righteousness. So if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. When I said those words, remember how I said the lie detector would have only went to three? When I said those words, the, the lie detector would have blew up. I knew that I knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt. We're talking about having a no-so experience. If you don't have that experience, you need to keep searching for God until you do because He's there. And, and, and the people that are coming forward this morning, basically they're coming forward because they're saying, I made that decision to, to have Christ be a part of my life and to put Him on the throne of my life. And they're making a decision to walk in newness of life. You know, the interesting thing about God, and like I started out, and I'm, I'm going to end with this. First of all, I want you to know at the end of these testimonies, I'm going to give anybody here an opportunity to accept Christ. And if you want to be baptized today, even if you weren't scheduled, you, you, you can be. But the thing about God and the, His Word, and, and those of us that have been here for a while, need to take these newer people under our wing and, and, and show them the things that we've been taught. And, and like I said, now we see through a, glim, a, a glass darkly, it says. You know, it's like we don't, we don't have a, the, a crystal. We're learning. One day we'll see him and we'll know him. But that doesn't mean we'll know everything. The best word I can think of is amazed. When I, when I met Jesus Christ and I knew that I knew, I was amazed that he loved me. And then he'd show me something else and I'd go, wow, look at this amazed again so for all eternity when we're in heaven we're going to see more of God he's going to reveal he's just going to go here I'll, I'll let you see a little bit more of me and he'll remove his hand and you see it and you're going to go wow and you're going to chew on that for 10,000 years and then then after 10,000 years of chewing on that and finally getting an understanding of that he'll 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 peel away a little bit more and you'll go oh my goodness We'll have an eternity at being amazed at the depth of his knowledge of his love and who he is. 
But for now, we need to put the flesh under. We need to follow him and walk in love like he asked us to. I mean, that's our marching orders. This is my commandment that you love one another. It's the greatest commandment above all else. So with that said, I want to congratulate those who made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I am honored to, to be a part of this. And as I said in the previous classes and sermons along this line, uh, this newness of life, it's, it's really good. I'm enjoying it 30 something years now and you know, we watched a movie and we saw a guy just come to know God and the struggle between who he was and who he is. And some of us have been walking in this for a while that we don't even remember. You know, I hear stories about what I used to do when I run into an old friend. Remember you did this? And I'm like, I, I don't remember that person. I, I don't. I don't remember what it feels like to, to, to be out and doing things and the feeling you get when you're doing certain I, I, I don't remember what it feels like not to be in control. I don't know what it feels like not to know God. I, I remember when I first got saved, looking up at the sky and going, oh my goodness, it's not just the sky. God, you're out there. I don't know what it's like to look up to an empty sky and just see stars and not know that there's a God. I don't remember what it's like not to know God is with me. There's no place I can go where he's not with me. There's nothing I could do where he goes, that's it, you did too much, I got to get out of here. You know, it's funny, the Bible, sometimes there seems to be apparent contradictions, but there really isn't. Because Paul tells us to forget those things that are behind, and you should. You shouldn't be dragging yourself through the mud, but then you read through most of the scriptures, it says, don't forget God, don't forget what he did. Don't for so on one hand, there's things we forget, but on the other hand, there's things we should never forget. So if you're here today and you've been a Christian for a while, I would just want to encourage you to remember what it was like and remember what he delivered you from and be grateful. The Bible says it's his love and his kindness that leads us to repentance. When I'm re mindful of how lost I was and what he did for me is what makes me want to love him and, and, and do what's right. So, okay, Miss Holly, I'm going to go get ready. I'm going to buy a heater for next time. <laughs>